Welcome to this heat transfer video lecture. Today we're going to start talking about internal convection and specifically we're going to talk about hydrodynamic considerations. So this is where the fluid mechanics of the situation would um, impact internal convection. So first of all, what is internal convection? Well I'm going to start by talking about external convection again. If you recall, before we talked about having a a flat plate and that flat plate may be heated at a temperature of TS and what we saw as our fluid encountered the leading edge of that flat plate was that you started to have uh, both a velocity and a thermal boundary layer form so external convection has a lot to do with the that the formation of these boundary layers so let's call this delta is the velocity boundary layer thickness. So external convection, we were convecting from our surface through this boundary layer and up into the bulk fluid or the free stream. So we were had heat transfer going from TS to T infinity. And basically this boundary layer, it is still bound at some, at some thickness. So we're typically talking about transfer of heat from TS through that boundary layer up into this sort of infinite fluid. So the difference between external convection and internal convection, so if you could imagine now you have two flat plates in parallel here. So you can imagine the same thing happening on top as those viscous forces start to take hold, you're also gonna have a velocity profile form on the top and so the velocity boundary layer thickness would be delta here so as you can see at some point these two profiles are going to meet so when those profiles meet um, you get what's called fully developed flow so you no longer have this bulk t infinity up here what you end up getting is a mean temperature so if you're heating both sides of this as an example eventually all that heating is going to change this temperature so rather than dealing with t infinity because our system is bounded and there's now a finite amount of fluid in this channel we're going to be dealing with the mean temperature so when we talk about internal convection our q convection is not going to be um, h a times t surface minus t infinity rather because we're not dealing with this bulk infinite fluid we're going to be dealing with the mean temperature and as you could imagine so when I say mean I mean that temperature is averaged um, over the course of this this channel so you can imagine that if this is a heating system so if this is hot gradually the further down you go that mean temperature is going to change so our mean temperature can actually increase in the x direction axially then just remembering that the mean temperature means that the temperature is averaged uh, radially or in or uh, perpendicularly to our x-axis. So uh, looking at this differently, so at the entry of our pipe, when we're talking about those boundary layers forming, so this is a pipe or it could be a square channel or it could be two parallel plates, but as you can see um, we have this nice plug flow coming in but over time, because of those viscous effects, we start to have those boundary layers form and we start to have this velocity profile develop. So uh, as you get to the point where those two boundary layers converge, you start to have what's called a fully developed flow in this fully developed region. And once you get to that region, as long as the channel doesn't uh, change in dimension, we would see that we basically have the same velocity profile throughout. And again, convection is going to be dealing with the temperature difference of T surface minus T mean. So if this is where a heated system, that T mean is going to increase. It's going to be different whether you're here or here or here. And actually, you'd still be uh, heating up that flow because it's bound now. You're not you actually have the ability to impact your overall fluid temperature. So we need to represent that as the mean temperature rather than T infinity, which is the bulk fluid temperature. So the characteristics of heat transfer are going to be different. So this is called the hydrodynamic entrance region. So right at the beginning of your pipe or channel, you're going to have those boundary layers forming. Your Certainly your heat transfer characteristics are going to be different in this developing region 
or the entrance region than they are in the fully developed region. So when we talk about fully developed flow, you're going to hear that phrase over the next several lectures. We're talking about this region where those boundary layers have converged and where the flow becomes, um, at least the velocity profile becomes basically unchanged from that point on. So to calculate the mean velocity profile, this is going to come from doing a force balance, a differential force balance. So the different forces, you're going to have these uh, uh, shear stresses, you're going to have pressure forces. I'm not going to go into the detail. We won't really have to deal with this much. Just know that we're talking about the mean velocity as we, so when we talk about velocity, we'll talk about the mean velocity. We won't really have to worry as much about this curvature other than by knowing that, than knowing that characteristics of fluid flow are different in the entrance region versus the fully developed region. So one thing that you should remember is this relationship. So the mass flow rate is given by, so the mass flow rate is equal to the fluid density times the mean fluid velocity times the cross-sectional area. And you can see it's actually really easy to back solve for the mean fluid velocity if you know the mass flow rate. So the mean fluid velocity would just be equal to m dot over rho times the cross-sectional area. So that's another way to get the mean velocity, and that's typically the version you would be needing to work with in this class. Reynolds number, if you recall that for flow over a flat plate, the Reynolds number was rho times fluid velocity times x divided by mu, the fluid viscosity. So now that we're talking about flow through a pipe or a channel, we're going to be using this more familiar form of the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number is rho times velocity times diameter. And again, we're using the mean velocity here over fluid viscosity, which could also be expressed as the velocity times the diameter over the kinematic viscosity. We can also put that Reynolds number in terms of mass flow rate. So if we just did some rearrangements using the relationship up here, you can express the Reynolds number in terms of mass flow rate. One thing to notice as compared to um, the external flow situation is that the Reynolds number here is bounded. The Reynolds number is a function of D, the pipe diameter. So the Reynolds number will be the same. It's not something that's going to vary as you get further and further into the pipe, as was the case with the unbounded flow over a flat plate. The critical Reynolds number, if you recall for flow over a flat plate, the critical Reynolds number was uh, 5 times 10 to the fifth or 500,000. Uh, we're going to be using a much more familiar number. So the critical Reynolds number for transition from laminar to turbulent for flow through a pipe is approximately 2300. In other classes you may have seen something like 2000, so we're right about in the same ballpark. And this is an approximation, but this is the number we'll typically use in this class. So to characterize whether the flow is laminar or turbulent, we would use this critical Reynolds number of 2300. And again, because the pipe diameter, or rather, if the pipe diameter stays constant, then this Reynolds number would be constant pretty much through the entire uh, pipe. So one thing that will be interesting to us is that hydrodynamic entry length, or how, how far, far into the pipe do you have to get before the flow becomes fully developed. And that depends on whether the flow is laminar or turbulent. So for laminar flow, you would see that our this entry region, x sub fd comma h, this hydrodynamic entry region, um, divided by the pipe diameter is going to be approximately 0.05 times the Reynolds number. So what you would do is you would calculate the Reynolds number based on pipe diameter, multiply that by 0 0.05, and then you would multiply that whole thing by D to give you that hydrodynamic entry length. For turbulent flow, this number is typically independent of Reynolds number. And if, the, if we know that the flow is turbulent, that entry length is basically going to be between 10 and 60 pipe diameters. So let's say that you had a pipe that is 10 centimeters in diameter. Well, you would know that the hydrodynamic entry length is going to be either um, it's going to be between one meter and six meters for a 10 centimeter diameter pipe so let's say that same pipe so if the pipe has a diameter of 10 centimeters or 0 0.1 meter 
and it has a length of let's say a thousand meters we could make this assumption so the hydrodynamic entry length at most would be uh, six meters so we could say oh, really only 0.6 percent of the pipe has to deal with that hydrodynamic entry length so we could make the assumption that the flow is just fully developed throughout just with the assumption that the entry length is a very small percentage of the total pipe length and that's a, an assumption that is quite common so uh, basically if the pipe is really really long and the entry length is really short then you could make the assumption that the flow is pretty much fully developed and that velocity profile would be constant so it makes solving the problem a little bit easier. So these are just some uh, good terms and concepts to understand. In our next video lecture we're going to talk about the thermal boundary layers and the thermal entry region.